Hello, and welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the ups and downs of the creative process and how to keep it moving. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. I am a writer, singer, improv comedy newbie, science fiction geek, and creativity coach who loves helping right-brained folks get unstuck. I am so excited to be coming to you with interviews and coaching calls to show you the depth and breadth both of creative pursuits and creative people, to give you some insight into their experiences and to inspire you. My guest today is a writer whose work is well known to science fiction and horror fans. Robert Shearman is prolific, having written fiction as well as drama for stage, radio, and television. His work has won awards, including the World Fantasy Award and the World Drama Trust Award. His contribution to the revived Doctor Who series, the episode Dalek, which is how I first encountered his work, was nominated for a Hugo Award. I met Rob at Regeneration Who, and he graciously agreed to talk to me for this podcast. Fair warning, while Dalek and the Chimes of Midnight, two of Rob's best-loved pieces for Doctor Who, are over a decade old, I want to be sure you know that this interview does include spoilers. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Rob Shearman. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Rob. Hello. <laughs> so, how did you start writing? I always, I think I was wanted to write, um... I don't remember a time when that wasn't an ambition, but the reality of it, I think, was that I was a very, very nervous kid and I had a terrible stammer. And um, the only way that I could cope at school, I found, eventually, was by the written word, where I felt intelligent, because speaking out loud, I felt stupid, Mm -hmm. because I couldn't get words out. And I also, at the same time, began public speaking, as a means of trying to force myself to speak. And so it's a mixture of starting to write uh, short stories and reading an awful lot and trying to be influenced by those things I was reading and at the same time trying to act. But I was such a terrible actor. Um, and I began auditioning for things and I, would, I did quite good auditions and then they'd realise in rehearsal how bad I really was. And at university, after the first year, I, I ran student theatre um, which was great, but I couldn't be in anything because I knew how bad I was. And I began writing plays because it seemed to me that the only way I could still be involved was by doing scripts. And I kept on thinking at the beginning, well, you know, maybe I could even write myself a small part. And I very quickly realised that I wouldn't want someone as bad as me ruining what I'd written because the writing meant so much more to me than standing on stage and showing off. And, and it, was, it was a funny thing. I, I still think of it this way. I think that it feels like safe showing off. Mm-hmm. When, 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 when I see actors and they're having a great time and they're on stage and they get all the attention, um, I envy that a bit sometimes. Um, and I feel I can do it without feeling so embarrassed. If I go and see a stage show of mine, I can feel all that pride at the good bits, but also the bits where things aren't working. <laughs> no one needs to know I was involved. And I've been at shows I've written which have been terrible. And in the interval I come out and I, you know, it's like Peter denying Jesus. You know, I, I, I stand around and I just say, oh, I, yeah, it's a terrible show. I'm not going to suddenly say, well, actually, I think you'll find that I wrote it because that would be awful. And so the actors are up on stage suffering with all my bad lines. And I'm in the bar with an ice cream saying, oh, it's, it's awful. It's awful. So um, it, it felt safer. You know, it was a way out of my shyness that felt also mm-hmm. safe. And I love words. I love mucking about with words. And I think because I couldn't express them. Because even now when I'm talking, I'm going through a thesaurus in my head. Because if I know what I'm going to say too much, I stammer it. Mm-hmm. So um, I often don't use the right word I want to use because I suddenly know that that would cause me to have a stutter. When I go through immigration at, at uh, you know, customs, which I get very nervous about, because they ask you, you know, are you here for business or for vacation? And I can't suddenly say the word vacation. Oh. So what I have to do is talk around it. That's my only way out of the stammer is you talk mm-hmm. around. And they don't want to hear your life story. In fact, actually it makes them suspicious. So I've had situations at immigration because of my trying to avoid my stammer, because I can't answer a simple question directly when it's a yes or no answer. The problem I have is I can't say my name very often. 
I've done radio interviews quite often, Radio 4 interviews, and I, and I can chat, as you'll become aware, because I can, I, I can be quite garrulous, but I can't answer simple questions. So mm-hmm. I can't so they say things like, well, introduce yourself. And I think, I can't. When we were doing Doctor Who, you'd go around the, the table before a read-through. We had to say our names. And you about 50 people, and it would get to you, and I couldn't say my name. I'd go, I, um, 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 I'm, I'm one, one, one of the... And, and everyone there knew who I was, and they just look at me, and it would be embarrassing. Mm-hmm. It, it's, writing for me was always about finding the alternatives to what I could otherwise be saying. Conversation, that doesn't happen so often. So I, I, I would hide more and more in writing. And the fact and the possibilities that that writing will change every single time you do it, if that makes any sense. That makes absolute sense. I mean, the thing which I still find the most wonderful part about writing, and also the scariest part about writing, is the thing which people very, very rarely say, but it's true for all writers, is that no matter how much you prepare, you know, if I go out to write one day and I say, I've got to write today um, 4,000 words on my new story, and I think I'm going to reach that, that middle section now, and I know what's going to happen, and I'm aware that if I sit down at the table at which I write at and I say, yeah, that's going to have a Diet Coke first, the words I would write when I come back from my Diet Coke will just be different to the words mm-hmm. I'd have written before. But the same intention will be there, but every great thing that you ever read by any writer is spontaneous. And no matter how much Shakespeare prepared the to be or not to be speech, that just happened to be what he wrote at that moment. And ten minutes later he'd have written different lines. And it's knowing that, it's knowing that everything is still random even though it could be prepared for for weeks and weeks, makes it scary but also thrilling. It's, mm-hmm. it's knowing that, there's, that there are an infinite number of ways of writing the same sentence, pretty much, or the same passage that, of that day's writing. And you can come back sometimes from writing a, a, day's, a day's work and be really annoyed because you knew that it just wasn't the best case scenario for that day's writing. Sometimes you, go, you come home and you're so relieved it was actually good and you know the next day you'd, you'd, you'd come back and write them the same thing and it would be half as good you just happen to catch the right moment and it's about catching the lightning in the bottle i think writing it's scary for that you know you mm-hmm. i mean do you find that as well i mean yeah bit? and i mean i haven't thought about it in that way that you know what you write right the second is different than what you write tomorrow yeah. morning about the same thing but you know i've definitely had the times where there there was one one morning when i was working on the book that you have yeah i think i wrote 10 pages in an hour and i finished it and i felt like i had run a marathon cuz yeah. i was just kind of sitting there going i have absolutely no idea where this came from yeah yeah and then it's you exhausting. know the next day and thrilling yeah, yeah. oh absolutely yeah, i yeah. mean it was just like whoa but then the next day, you know, you That's sit down so and you're like, "Yeah, where, where's that thing that happened yesterday?" And why, I, how I always do think I of get it. it yeah, it's back. If it, it's when I it's what I refer to to myself to make myself laugh when I'm going through it. It's like suddenly your brain's translating everything from Serbo Croat. <laughs> um, it's like you don't understand how English works anymore. All the ideas are still fine, but it's like you don't know how mm-hmm. to make sentences work. It's like everything sort of glumps upon the page. Other times it can be amazing. Um, it's a matter, I find it's a matter of trying to not be scared. Because writing, I think, is a scary process. Right? I think particularly mm-hmm. people are waiting for it, and, they, and, you know, they often are. You're dealing with, with commissions, people are expecting. I'm always behind on what people are expecting. Books and collections and scripts. People always wanted them last week. And you say, OK, on Monday I'm going to go out and I will write this. And you go out that Monday and you say, I won't come home. Um, until I've finished. And I just go out into London, I walk around, I go to art galleries and museums, because I want to trick my brain into thinking I'm having fun. Because if I'm having fun, then at least, if I say, well, it doesn't matter. First few hours, I'll do nothing. I'll just look at some paintings, and eventually I'll put some words down. And I won't go home until I've finished it, but that's up to me how long it takes. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I sit down at an office, if I get up at nine in the morning, as I know some writers are very good at doing, I just look at it and I panic. I just think... I'm not ready for this. Because the, again, it, it's that sort of psychological certainty of knowing that half an hour later it could be better. And you get almost wrong-footed 
by your own sense of wanting to be the best you can be. Because mm-hmm. you know it could always be better, even as you're writing it. Because even though you can redraft, and people always redraft, and you should redraft, you're still redrafting from that base. And it's mm-hmm. often the base that has ruined it. You know, if you get the base at the wrong moment, you're only redrafting what was already terrible. And that's always what, what, what frightens me. That's true. Whereas if you cut stuff that's mm-hmm. actually pretty good, you can make it better, but at least, the you know... It's always, I, I always think of it in terms of, and it's often an excuse not to write, which is terrible. Right. But it's, it's about saying, I want to write at the right moment. And sometimes a story or a script, it just isn't cooked yet. And it's not laziness to acknowledge that actually it needs another week before you're ready to write this. It just needs walking around and thinking. Because thinking is most of what you do. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I just go for long walks all the time. And in my head, I'm... I'm sort of indirectly trying to solve stuff until I think, yeah, yeah, it's ready, it's ready. And it's, I think most of writing is actually about getting better at telling when the moment to write is. When I, when I started out writing in my 20s, that's what I got wrong all the time. I mean, I wrote some good stuff. I, I, I got lucky. I wrote some stage plays that, that, that still get revived now. I had one in New York a couple of years ago, which I wrote in when I was 22, and I went to see it, and I was flown over, and I was... It was off-off Broadway, and I was, I was very proud, and I just thought that was a lucky script. I wrote another script, I think, a, a month later that was terrible. And I'm better now at writing things which I know will at least be OK, because I won't write when it's going to be terrible. Mm-hmm. But that's the hard thing to learn. It's about knowing not, also not when to rush it, because, because your brain is also making you feel guilty that you're not working harder. Sometimes you just can't work any harder that day. You don't. You shouldn't write any more than you than you mm-hmm. have, and yet it feels that you're just avoiding it. Because yeah. avoiding is always a thing which you're trying to avoid. But actually, avoiding can be good. It can. It can. There are times when you definitely need yeah. to t- just take a break and let your brain percolate on stuff. And I love that you go out for walks and you go to the museum and everything because you're actually like giving yourself so much other stuff to. Work oh yeah, with, I, mean, you know? I, I mean, I found an amazing place to work. I mean, I mean, I write at the National Theatre. Uh, which I actually did once kind of write for back in the 90s. And I've got various seats I like to move around because it's a public area, so I don't feel like I'm um, not engaged with the world, but I wear headphones Mm -hmm. and I can walk along the Thames, I can go as far as the Shakespeare's Globe and I can walk back to Westminster Bridge and I can always just go for ten quarter of an hour walks and think, what am I writing in the next paragraph? Let's just work it out. And then I come back and probably write another eight, nine paragraphs because it just spirals off from there. And it's a constantly sort of saying, OK, how do I get to the next bit where I can take a break? And that way, eventually, things just get finished. But at home, I would never get... I'd go on YouTube. Mm-hmm. I'd start watching YouTube videos. I'd start feeding my yeah. cat. I'd start... You well, know, there's and, nothing and, new to look at. at yeah, home. and it's boring. I mean, who wants to be bored as you're writing? I mean, right. what, I mean, what I love is actually sort of distracting my brain. I, I, I go to bookshops and look along the shelves. And what I'm really doing is I'm like, oh, oh, they've got a new book out. And I'm thinking, but what I could do maybe is that maybe he's got a wife. Maybe it's not even a him. Maybe it's actually, maybe I'm writing for this from the wrong perspective. Oh, what's this? That's not a nice cover. And Because you, your brain can do more than one thing at once. Mm-hmm. And making your brain actually do that in a funny way just makes it excited. Yeah. The hard part about writing is being bored writing. And I try very hard not to be bored because being bored just makes it boring, obviously. Yeah. 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 So you already told me this story. Okay. But because people who are going to listen to this don't know this story. Sure. Tell me about writing The Chimes of Midnight. Well, that was a weird one. Um, I'd, this was 2000. Um, I'd written a, my first Doctor Who big finish adventure called the holy terror and um yeah it was it was odd i mean i i'd been commissioned to write a story it ended up being about a shape-shifting penguin and it was not what i'd ever have chosen if someone had said to me write your one doctor who story you know which, which i what i assumed it was going to be i wouldn't have chosen that i'd have chosen something a bit more spooky like chimes of midnight and so i was given this second chance i was just asked to do it but there was no time they wanted to do a Paul McGann season. Paul McGann had just done his first season for Big Finish and he'd said yes to more. But they had to catch him quick, even though they wouldn't come out for about 18 months. They wanted six stories 
and a sort of like an arc. We, we met in a pub and they wanted me to go first. Um, and I said, OK. So they had to be bouncing off my one. And I went away and I had an idea of a synopsis and I sent it. And I had to start writing that in the next two days. And they wrote back and they said, uh, no, I don't think we want that. I mean, it began, it was like chimes, but you'd go upstairs every episode and it'd be 25 years later. They said, no, we don't want that, but you just keep it in the house. And I thought, I'm not sure how to sustain that, but I have no choice. Mm-hmm. So I began writing it and I wrote it in about a week. But the terror of it was I hadn't worked out what it was about as I was writing it. So I would have maybe two days per episode. And the first day was mostly spent panicking about the fact I had no idea what to write next, having written the, the previous episode before. And then I'd write it and I'd do a cliffhanger and I'd laugh because cliffhangers actually were quite good. But I had no idea how to resolve it or where the story went. And I just found it was a... I remember, I, I can picture I can picture where I was for certain moments of thinking, well, maybe I can run the chauffeur over. That, that would give me 10 minutes. <laughs> so you, it was trying not to make it seem padded, but also try and make it seem... I was trying to make it funny, because I'm basically a comedy writer, when all said and done, comedy is, mm-hmm. is, is what I love going back to, because even though I write quite dark stuff, I think funny is great. I know. think the mix of, of comedy yeah. and the, the totally spooky what it, the heck is going on here yeah. stuff is really part of what makes that one so good. Well, when I delivered it, I mean, I was really expecting that, because I didn't think it made much sense. And I remember during episode three, I suddenly thought, oh, I know who killed these. It's the house. The house is alive. I didn't know. When people say to me that they that listen back to it and they say, well, we could tell what was happening by episode one. I think it's more than I did. Because I had no, I mean, I, mean, I did go back and I did kind of the only thing I did when I, once I worked out the four episodes and I'd finished them, was I went back and I began cutting out various pointless red herrings, which I thought could be important but weren't. Right. In fact, they're not all cut out. Um, I heard it back a while back because I was planning on doing, I was asked to adapt it for TV and it didn't really work out. But I heard it again for the first time in years. And there's stuff in episode one, like, I think things burn in fires and then don't Mm -hmm. and all of that's kept in for some reason but actually that was me saying maybe that's important I've no idea yet it wasn't important but it also seemed atmospheric so we kept it which is the wrong reason although no one's ever complained about that the one problem we have is I delivered the script and they were very kind big finish they said we really like this we'd be doing it I said but it can't be episode one it can't be the first story because you've taken the story arc with Charlie and the R101 too far. And I said, they said, we didn't want to reveal any of this before about story four or five. And you've done it in story one. And I said, mm-hmm. oh, well. And they said, but emotionally, we now need it for your story. We'll swap places with Mark Gatiss's story. And they put mine second. Which was a shame in a way because I was aware it was a January release originally. And I thought that was fine after Christmas. And it suddenly, because it was a Christmas setting, it was now going to be mid-February it came out. Which is a bit pointless for a Christmas story. But hey, no one cares now. Nope. I mean, um, and we recorded it very, very, we did a day and a half's recording in Bristol with Paul McGann. And it was good, I thought. But it wasn't finished for another year or so until it came out. So I spent that whole year assuming people were going to hate it. Because you do, because it, I, all I could remember was I didn't know what I was doing as I wrote it. Mm-hmm. And I, I hate writing totally blind I think, it, I think it's an insult to the audience with Chimes Chimes is the only story I did for, for Doctor Who in which I genuinely feel deep down ashamed of the fact that I didn't do the homework beforehand because with other stories they might have problems with them but I knew what the themes were I knew kind of why I was writing it with Chimes I was just I, I kind of did, it was like it's, what, what was that was that form of sort of writing where you just You just write without thinking about it. Like free writing. Yeah, yeah. And I don't trust free writing. I think free writing produces... It's an exercise. It doesn't Mm -hmm. produce good stuff. Well, no. And Chimes is kind of free writing. And therefore, I'm a bit scared of Chimes because I think it is good. I don't think it has any right to be good. I'm relieved that it's not hated. I'm amazed that actually it's quite liked by a lot of people, including yourself. But a part of me also... Is slightly annoyed by it because you think, well, I didn't really put much work into that. 
Um, but I'm proud of it. I, th- I think I think it's a good story. It's a know? very good story. And I'm proud that people like it so much. I'm proud that it's become the one story that I did for Big Finish or for Doctor Who at all, I suppose, which, because it's Christmas-based, does provide a lot of people with an annual tradition. I know people do listen to it. I, I, you do, That's I think. Me. But I've heard from many people that they will listen to it as they wrap Christmas presents, and I think, well, every year? I mean, aren't you bored out of your minds doing no, that? No, because it's been another year. But you know what's going to happen. So? Because yeah. this is the thing. It really does work. I mean, it hangs together. If you, if you had not told me that you didn't know yeah. what you were doing when you put it together, I never would have guessed. And and I am an unrepentant pantser. I cannot write if I know what's going to happen. I, I can write if I know. Uh, yeah, I have well, to get here. I have to agree with you, actually. You know, yeah. So, so, yeah. Because I, I write mean, short stories mostly now. Mm-hmm. I can never write a short story if I know the ending. Or rather, what I have is I have in my head an ending to make myself feel comfortable, but I know I can't use it because it's too obvious. Mm -hmm. So everything I write is about avoiding the ending I knew because I know that means it's dull. But I also know if I don't have something in my head as a possible... Because I think of it like a map. And if you're just driving to the middle of nowhere, um, that's a little bit awkward. If you feel, well, I know roughly where I'm going, but along the way I'll find more interesting places to stop. And actually, I may not end up anywhere near where I think my, my bed and breakfast hotel is. I'll go to another hotel that I'm staying at tonight. Um, that, for me, is how to write. But if I actually write stories where I find nothing interesting along the way and I end up exactly where I thought I was going to, I always bin it. I want to be surprised myself. What actually I right. normally do now with short stories, and I know that you've very kindly just bought some of mine, <laughs> um, I often actually, what I do now is I find that I've got the story... And I get to what the ending I thought was. And I realise, but what happens next? Mm -hmm. And most people have been thrown, because people teach my short stories in Britain, which is amazing sometimes. And and they refer to it as this weird thing that you reach a natural conclusion and then I still go on for another, for twice as long again. Because I then want to see what the reality of that is 20 years later. And that's quite shocking. And it means that I keep myself interested because... Because the little story that would have been there is just sort of neat and annoying. But if you keep on questioning it and saying... I read a story about um, Luxembourg vanishing in Love Songs for the Shine Cynical, the one that you got. The one I got? And, you know, Luxembourg just one day vanishes. You know, you wake up in the morning and it's just gone. It's just a bit of sea where it was. It's about a woman whose husband was over in Luxembourg on a business trip. She's not sure now whether... He's alive or dead. No one cares. It's only Luxembourg. And it was about actually... And I reached a point where I thought, well, I know where that's going to go. And because I kept asking more and more emotional questions about how she dealt with that, it became this terribly dark, quite emotional story, which I didn't think it was when I began a rather stupid what-if idea. And what I like doing with my fiction, what I like doing with Times of Midnight as well, actually, in a funny way, is I like saying hey, it's a sort of quite light comedy. And then you say, but maybe I'm now going to go down a a more emotionally honest uh, and realistic path from a premise that you've already bought as being utterly ridiculous. And that's the way I like writing. It's good fun. And it keeps you on your toes, actually. It means you come up with stupid ideas. And the idea is stupid. But out of it, you grow something which actually feels... Chekhovian sometimes it's weird I mean I, I love writing like that and, yeah. and if it goes well I'm the proudest writer in the world on the days it works I just come home thinking oh, I'm a genius I think <laughs> I'm not but but I feel amazing when I know I've done mm-hmm. a good day's work from a really stupid premise sometimes you know it's lovely though yeah I mean yeah. my my book which you probably haven't had a chance even to look at the first sentence, but... No, it hasn't properly downloaded my... I have it on my Kindle, <laughs> the, uh, but I haven't got the... The Wi-Fi in this hotel is not... It's a, it's a little It's odd. a bit sketchy, yeah. so it keeps on... I mean, I'll get it when I go to a better well, Wi-Fi spot. I started it from an unfinished sentence prompt, said the baby had been born with blank. Okay. And, you know, what's the first thing you think of? A silver spoon in its mouth. And yeah. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there for, I don't know, probably a weekend, 
because I'd, I'd written, you know, I mean, I had this sentence, and I'm going, you, you, you can't be born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Mm. And as I recall, I had been reading more Neil Gaiman right around that time. Okay. And, and, and I, I have a feeling that that's at least part of why, at some point in the course of going, but you can't do that, this little voice came up in my head and said, but what if you were? Yeah. And the so, best thing ever yeah. to ask yourself as a writer, mm-hmm. you keep on hitting this voice saying to you, well, you can't do that. And you say, why not? Mm-hmm. And the thing I would say, when I was, I was at Edinburgh University, um, uh, Edinburgh Napier University, I was resident writer there for a year, a couple of years ago. And, and I had, therefore, students who come to my office. And the only question that I would always say to them, you know, I'd say, look, write whatever you want. But the questions always have to be to yourself, when you hit, hit a wall, you say, well, why? Why, have I, why is that a wall? Why, why can't I just do that? Why can't I take it to a magical real as opposed to I want to? But also the other question is, so what? Which for me is, I need to believe as I'm writing something that it matters to a degree. And the problem is, is that so much writing in the world, inevitably, you don't need. You know, most of the stuff I've written, I don't pretend matters, but I had to believe it mattered when I wrote it. Mm-hmm. And if as you're writing something, you even think to yourself, yeah, it's not that good, then make it good or write something better. But actually, usually make it good because you usually can. Make it suddenly more eccentric. Make it not that dull, but this, but obviously, we can't break down that wall because that's the wall of realism. No, go crazy. I mean, Neil does that very well. Mm-hmm. I mean, Neil will just say, I mean, American God spirals out of this terribly simple idea and he just runs with it. You can sense the exuberance of a writer just saying, I can go as far as I want. No one can stop me. If I want to fly, I'll fly. Douglas Adams does that as well in a very, very different way. He just, he keeps on thinking, if I hit a narrative kink, I'll make the narrative kink the solution and I'll use that as as the means... Of flying higher, as you know, imaginatively. That's what you need. It's hard if you're writing, obviously, something which has to be very, very strictly realistic. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's still ways of doing that. I mean, it's just you can't be quite as nonsensical as, as perhaps you're tempted to be. But it, it's fun just to sort of just ask yourself. The thing I would always tell students is, no one will die if you get it wrong. The thing, I've written so much terrible stuff, I've written some awful things, particularly some really dreadful early stage plays, which were staged and audiences were very bored, but no one (laughs) ever died. Now, if I were a really bad airline pilot, people would die. (laughs) If I did really bad heart surgery, for the first time, you know, sometimes you'll go to the hospital, there will be someone doing that for the first time. That's scary. Um, I've been on aeroplanes a lot. Maybe I've occasionally flown with people who've never done this before. That's scary. If I write, if if you write a a non-naturalistic short story for the first time and it's crap, no one will die. The worst that will happen is it's rubbish. So, so what? You write something else. Therefore, because you can't hurt anybody by writing bad stuff, you might as well write some bad stuff as well. Yeah, I, you think know, I think that's has, important. Everybody has bad stuff they need to. Oh God, yeah. Because if paint, you don't write, draw, dance, you know, whatever. I think the important thing is that I think the only interesting fiction worth reading is stuff that takes a risk. And if everything you write succeeds, you're not taking a risk. You just think you're taking a risk because all risks can't work. Because how can therefore they be risks? Mm-hmm. You know, on Doctor Who, Stephen Stephen Moffat, you know, who who I adore. He's a great friend. And what I think was great about his time on the show was it was genuinely risk-taking to the point that things genuinely collapsed sometimes because he didn't know it would work. If he always got it right, he wasn't trying hard enough, he felt. That, I think, is brave writing. But to actually when people are genuinely going to watch it and genuinely blame him for it failing. Oh, absolutely. But it has, some things have to fail. Shakespeare, I mean, Shakespeare is my, is my big passion. I love Shakespeare. There are some terrible Shakespeare plays. I mean, we don't say that very often, as often as we should, but Time in of Athens, for example, is appalling. But without it, we wouldn't have King Lear. Now, people will stage right. Time in of Athens. They wouldn't if he wasn't Shakespeare. But right. even in his own lifetime, it wasn't staged because it was abortively poor. It was an aborted play. But without it, you don't get to something else. 
most writing is built, you know, it's ladders built upon this bits of dung and the dung were your failed stories. That's how we get to be good. That's how any art works. You know, art has to be a risk taker, which means how can you therefore be scared of failing? You need the failures in order to do the good stuff. Yeah, and you learn from all of the failures. Oh, yeah. Well, as long as as you allow yourself to. As long as as you don't take them too personally. Right. You know, I think the danger is, is because writing is so emotionally difficult at times and you feel very, very vulnerable. When you fail, you just think, oh, I'm, I'm a terrible writer, I'm a terrible person. No, who cares? It's just a bit of... It's only bloody words. I mean, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, all writing matters, and at the same time, right. all writing doesn't, doesn't matter. It's, that, it's both at once. You know, it's lovely when you write... I mean, Chums of Midnight, as, a, as an example, you know, there's a story that has somehow survived 18 years since I wrote it. People like it. If I'd never written it, the world would be exactly the same. It would... Maybe not exactly. Yeah, mostly. pretty much. And yet I'm proud right. it exists, but it didn't have to exist. And right. that's also important too. It's the recognition of both things at once. I love trying to put into the world things which I think, on a very, very humble level, in a terribly minor way, might make the world a slightly better place because I think they're good. But if I suddenly fell off the roof and I stopped writing, I don't think the world would actually honestly not recover from the fact I'd stopped writing. And I think that's important to, to acknowledge. You know, we aren't that important, and the stories aren't so important, but they also are. You know, it's that, both things at once. That Oscar Wilde quote, that life is too important to be taken seriously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's writing. It's a joy. I mean, it's also, it's horrible to do writing, but how lucky are we that we're even allowing ourselves the space to do this? There are people we know who are desperate to write and never will. Right. So I regard every day, I mean, I'm a full-time writer. It's the only job I've got. I don't write every day. I feel guilty for not because I'm aware of how precious that time is for other people. But I also know I can't write every day because, as I said in the, you know, through the earlier question, um, it's not always the right time to write something. You'll, you'll spoil the idea. Right. But therefore, it's a privilege to be able to write. But also, it's, you have to not take it so seriously that you wreck the privilege. <sighs> Sorry, that's I'm, light and airy, but no, it's it's. I'm, I think I'm, it's te- important. I'm very passionate about that. Yeah. I, think, I think that's very important. You know. Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna. I'll, I'll let you ask another question. Turn us in yeah, a different yeah, yeah. direction because I'm I'm really curious. So, Dalek. Okay. Yeah. Came out of Jubilee. It did. And of course. I didn't know that until after I had seen Dalek, and I was just you saw discovering Dalek first. Right. right, and I was just discovering Big Finish and all of that kind of stuff. And so, obviously, when you find out, oh, this came from this other thing, and it was a much longer whatever, you know, if you're curious at all, you're going to go find the first one. And I found it interesting when I was listening to it because you know I could see where Dalek came from, yeah. and yet it's. Jubilee is also so different. I mean, it's, just for a start, I didn't expect so the little movie ad at the beginning that had me laughing out loud because Dalek yeah. is not that kind of no, it really isn't. funny. So I'm really curious to know how it was to take something larger and more elaborate like yeah. Jubilee and turn it into Dalek. It, it, it was, it's about audience, actually. With Dalek, Dalek had to be written for an audience of Mm eight-year-olds we were being told to never forget that it could be for adults it should be for adults but an eight-year-old had to be able to watch this jubilee was written for 30-something fanboys because doctor who was dead any people who cared about doctor who at this point were people like me and who who, (laughs) but at that stage you know i mean you know that because any people who were still listening to it weren't any any longer kids and they wanted mm-hmm. something which is a bit more adult and was also a bit more in my in, in that case it's quite meta jubilee i mean jubilee is about also my argument that we've kind of ruined the way that i mean that we've become predictable with our storytelling it's actually about predictable storytelling jubilee die couldn't be any of those things it was its job was to be halfway through the first series of what could be the only series of the revival mm-hmm. It had to be reintroducing the big monster in Doctor Who 
in a very, very simple way that wouldn't put people off um, and not make them feel it was trying to be too clever about how we did that. Jubilee was all about being clever. And Jubilee is almost a suffocatingly over-clever script. It doesn't quite work for that either. I think it falls apart quite badly. People, I mean, Doctor Who fans, as a rule, and it's very sweet because they think they're complimenting me, they'll say to me things like, oh, I love Jubilee. It's a lot better than Dalek. As if I hadn't really written Dalek, <laughs> although I had actually written both. As if they thought I had probably had more interference with Dalek, which is true, mm-hmm. but it was good interference. And I think that the problem with Jubilee is it has no ending. Um, I hadn't really worked out what to do. And I ran out of time. And to be honest, I was I was very arrogant. I I I wanted to be, I was searching for a sequel. I wanted to leave Jubilee's ending that I didn't fix the time thing. I did that in a second story later, where in the second story we'd go to the nineteen oh three thing, which was set before it, and I thought I'll fix it in that. And Gary Russell quite rightly said, "No, I commissioned one story from you. Just do the one story," and that was fine. With Dalek, it was, I knew with Dalek I had to tell. A relatively simple and I think quite emotional story. Oh, definitely. And Jubilee's not very emotional. It's a very, it's quite a cold, nasty piece. Yeah. It's 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 clever. It ha- it's it, it, it's more sophisticated. Mm-hmm. It's quite political. It was my attempt to try and do sort of like black comedy, I Claudius type stuff because I love things like that. But Dalek, I think, is although it's annoyingly simplistic for me at times. Looking back at it. Because I do find that frustrating, because I, I do want to be a clever writer. I think it's a purer piece of work, thanks to Russell T. Davis, constantly making me, reminding me that the audience wasn't trying, you know, I didn't have to try and show off. Mm-hmm. Um, so with Jubilee, I kind of threw it away very quickly. I, I, I listened back to it, I said, <laughs> well, that's useless. And I, and I just took basically the one idea, and I tried not to write anything from it. I think there's only one scene that's remotely similar, and it's the scene where the Doctor meets the Dalek in the mm-hmm. cell, and they are very, very different scenes. I wrote them very differently, but, but the moment is the same. Right. And with Colin, it's a much more arch scene, and with Chris Eccleston, it's this weird, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, spitting fury. Yes. And, and that was a shock to write. I didn't know it was going to end up like that. I didn't know that Chris would do it like that either. But I'm really proud of that. I, 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 I think. I mean, I like both. Mm-hmm. I find Jubilee feels unfinished, and I'm proud of. I think some of it is very funny and very nasty, and and I and I do like it, and I'm proud people like it so much because it has gone down quite well. But I think Dalek is actually the is is the more accomplished piece of work, even though it's probably not as Doctor Who fan friendly as those apparently clever audio mm-hmm. versions are. If that makes sense. It, it does make sense. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I mean, it's, it's been a while since I watched Dalek. I think, actually, I may have watched it again after Into the Dalek because there were such There's clear a similarity, references. Yeah. Yeah. But it's been at least that long, so it's not as fresh in my head, and I don't remember when I last listened to Jubilee. I know I've listened to it more than once. Yeah. But, you know, they, they both, you're right, because they, they absolutely hit in completely different ways, and... I know when when I first watched Dalek, I mean, as an old school Who fan, I was not prepared for the, the new series to have the kind of emotional impact that it has in the first place, because yeah. that's not what we were used no, to. No, that's right. But, but I remember that episode just completely blew me away, because you, you think Daleks, you think shooting, fighting, you know, yeah. stuff like that, and, and the way that that episode ends was just so wow. Yeah. So so yeah, they're they're definitely completely different, and I do. I mean, I do like them both. I don't know if I could pick. You no, know, it's I one mean, of those. If I had to pick a favorite, I would have to qualify why I was. Well, Jubilee, picking. in a funny way, probably is more me. Um, not because I didn't write Dalek, but because Jubilee is my sense of humor. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, I think that it's probably a, it's probably a difficulty I have. I can't resist my black humor creeping into stuff. I mean, that's you'll find when you read my book. Um, And unfettered, that can actually occasionally be inappropriate. And I like writing inappropriate humour. I like seeing... I like seeing whether you can go too far with certain things. Because I want want to know why it's too far. And I want the audience to realise 
We're engaged in finding out levels of taste at times. And Jubilee is a really bad taste story. It really upset a few people. And Dalek is not bad taste. I mean, Russell, mm-hmm. I remember saying to me, there's a bit in Jubilee where um, if you boil the Dalek in its shell, the liquid that runs off, they would bottle and drink. Yeah. And it was tasteless and horrible, but it was the... And Russell said, oh, can we keep that, you think? And I said, not really, no. <laughs> and he said, no, I suppose not. But it is funny. And I said, it's, it's just wrong for the... He said, it's wrong mm-hmm. for the episode. Right. But, but Russell loved some of those ideas, mm-hmm. but also understood almost as he said them, but we can't do it in that simple retelling of a story which has that emotional right. curve. The hard thing, I suppose, was that... And the bit which is frustrating is that in Jubilee, Evelyn and the dark relationship is built upon yeah. what an hour of conversation. And in mm-hmm. dark, there's no time. Right. It's based upon Rose touching a dark and DNA being transferred, which, which is nonsense. And that handprint is like a sort of a bit of pseudoscience re- um, replacement mm-hmm. for genuine drama. And but there's no choice. I mean, we had to just. Dis- that was the first meeting. They were saying we need to have Rose bond with the Dalek, um, and the Dalek is changing because of that. But it can't be an intellectual discussion. Mm-hmm. It will have to be. Maybe Russell said she touches it, and I said okay. And I remember when I wrote the script, when I I wanted to pay off. And again, this is where I was going wrong at the time. And when she puts her hand on it and she pulls her hand away, she's left bits of skin. I mean, she, it, it, it's kind of stuck to it and it caused her pain. And Russell said, no, we don't need to do that. <laughs> and which is because I wanted to make it, if, it, if you know, it was going to be as simple and glib as the touching a Dalek casing. It ought to be a meaningful moment. I think it's almost a silly moment. I don't blame the episode for that. Mm-hmm. We had to get to the point right. where we see things happen. But it also feels weird, because the DNA of a time traveller, I have no idea what that's talking about. <laughs> and of course it's silly, and I remember I was at a science museum event some years ago in Manchester in, in Britain, and there were small children who were saying to me, can I ask a question of, the, of Mr Shearman? And it was Doctor Who writer's panel. And I said, sure. And they said, do you even know what DNA is? And I said, <laughs> I, said I did Google it. It had a very long name, and I thought, well... I'm sure DNA is what I call it. And the problem is, is that the science in Doctor Who can often be as insulting as that. Mm-hmm. Particularly, and I don't blame Russell for it, but under Russell, because he would use those science terms, Stephen just didn't even bother with that. So Stephen is so un- anti-science. But Russell would occasionally say things you think, well, if you don't do it, just don't call it DNA. I mean, I didn't want to call it DNA particularly. We had this discussion on Dalek, and again, I don't blame Russell's... Russell's instincts are far better, obviously, than mine. He's a much cleverer writer. But he wanted Van Staten, my uh, villain, mm-hmm. to have invented the internet. And I said, he didn't. And also, it's a set in the future. And you're casting a relatively young actor. He said, oh, no one knows who invented the internet. I said, you don't know who invented the internet, but people genuinely do. Yeah. It's, it's not fair to regard as the... The limit of, of, of accepted knowledge as being what you personally know, Russell. And that's the thing. He didn't really know how DNA worked, so that's fine. And I would say, yeah, but people are going to. And I, I didn't argue it very forcefully. I did also, but I did make sure that my villain owned the internet, not invented it. It, mm-hmm. go, it went backwards and forwards in rewrites a lot. And I kept on saying, he couldn't have invented it. Owning it is also ridiculous. But that's like a James Bond bit of comic right, villainy. Right. But saying he invented it, he didn't. And he's not even old enough. It was invented in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. He'd now be, in, you know, he'd be an elderly man. And he's not. And I got my way on that one. I don't blame Russell. I think that he's right. In a funny way, Doctor Who should be about... It shouldn't be about the intricacies of genuinely what it was like in Pompeii. Mm-hmm because then you're not writing Doctor Who, but it has to at least seem to pass some basic muster of what people expect to be particularly sort of relatively important science. But I don't, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to criticise. No, um, no, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. In case Russell's listening. Um, <laughs> because, because Russell, I mean, Russell's instincts on Doctor Who were entirely right about everything. Everything which I was worried about you know, the way in which the Doctor was 
going to say, I'm going to do this and I want to go there. Which I reacted, you know, because as a Doctor Who fan, I I was sort of the Doctor as being this sort of quite stuffy, patrician, well-spoken, don't call me Doc type mm-hmm. character. And Russell's instincts were on every single level about how to make that show work. Totally correct. And everything that I thought wasn't going to work, I was totally wrong about. And all of us were. I mean, Mark and Stephen and... Uh, and Paul and I, we were kind of lagging behind Russell's vision. We were trying to catch up to it. But we had our misgivings about it because we were still labouring under the idea of what we thought Doctor Who was. And Russell just got it right. And without Russell, there would be... I, I can't imagine anyone better to make that show suddenly work against all the odds Doctor Who is still going on, and that's because Russell's, in, Russell's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So if he is listening, he can now he can now feel less angry. <laughs> but it's true; it's, it's 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 really true. I mean, it's he he was utterly remarkable. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm psyched it's still around. I wouldn't be oh, here yeah, talking to you. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. It's still. I mean, it, it shouldn't be really, should it? I mean, it, I mean, it, it seems incredible that we're now reaching season eleven and our fifth Doctor mm-hmm. since it came back, and it was it should never have had that success. I mean, I was certain when it came back, we would get... I remember thinking, it's great it's coming back, but we'll never reach a, another regeneration. Because that, that's the first big test. And I thought, mm-hmm. in some ways, it's sad we can't bring it back when we know it won't survive more than a couple of, two, three years. It feels like, well, why are we even bothering? I, I mean, deep down, because I was thinking in my head, we had 26 years of the original series. That was amazing. And now we're going to get this sort of rather whatever it will be it will be a short epilogue even if it's three four seasons but there's a reasonable chance now I mean I'm not Mm -hmm. saying it will happen I still doubt it will because I'm I'm a pessimist but there's a chance that we could with the new series make it even longer than the classic series now and we're going to be halfway through it's true by the time that they they renew Jodie's contract Um, I find that incredible because it yeah. should never have happened that way. The show should be now dead again, easily. But it's not. And It's, it's always been the little show that could. I, I, I can't... I mean, it makes no sense to me that it ever worked. I mean, that's what I find great about... I mean, I love Doctor Who so much, but it should never have worked. Back in the 60s, it should never have worked. Because no one ever knew what they were doing. <laughs> I mean, that's what I find so funny about it, is it's made up as it went along, and it still is. And that's, you know, nothing else works like that. Nothing else can just be as random. Yeah. It, comes, it comes to what we were saying about writing earlier. Mm-hmm. No one knows where it's going. Right. And people tell you that you need to know everything. You have to have a series, Bibles for every TV show you work on now. And if you plot a novel, you should know how chapter 27 ends. And no, you shouldn't. In some ways, Doctor Who proves it. It, it's the joy of creation. It's the joy of discovery as you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Doctor Who is the best example of it I can think of. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, that to me is what all of it is about, is, is discovering something as you're doing yeah. it. Not necessarily even the thing that you thought you were going to discover. It, you know, it, it may be as simple as, is this going to work? Yeah. But it could be something completely unexpected and out of the blue. And if you hadn't tried the crazy thing in the first place, you never would have learned whatever Absolutely you learned. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great show. I mean, I'm, I'm still so amazingly proud that I got to be this terribly small part of it. You should be. Because, <laughs> cause again, I mean, that just seems bonkers to me that I was ever a Doctor Who writer. Because, wow. I can imagine that feeling. Cause, yeah, because yeah. I shouldn't be a Doctor Who writer. Because, you know, I mean, Doctor Who, is, Doctor Who is my childhood. Yeah. I mean, it's... Anyway, but yeah, yeah, weird. I, mean, I, I still pinch myself. I, I still can't quite believe it. I used to have these sort of daydreams about imagining myself, always as a writer, never as a character... As a writer on the Davison years, and I'm imagining that title sequence with the stars pulling mm-hmm. across, and I suddenly realised I did do it. I have a title sequence. It's not the one in my head because right. that was when I was a fan, but I did genuinely write an episode, and I have in this time tunnel. It says by Robert Sherman, which I look at occasionally. I don't watch the episode, but I might watch the. I might watch my name. You can't blame me for that. It's it, it's the weirdest thing. I can't I can't quite get over it. 
still, all these years later, yeah. I can't quite get over that I actually wrote some Doctor Who. Weird. So I'm going to change directions again. Okay. Because, you know, I know you've come, come to a bunch of events like this. Yeah. So obviously you get to go to interesting places and meet interesting people. And I'm just curious to know if you've ever noticed any way in which traveling has influenced what you do creatively. I hope it does. I think that the danger is anyway that you get so locked into what, how you think the world works that you start trying, sort of reacting against the world when it doesn't obviously adhere to those expectations. I, I, I was directing a show in India a few years ago, a play of mine I was asked to go and do for the Delhi Festival. And I was in a house of a Maharaja, which was great, and, but we had servants. And I didn't want the servants to be put out. And I was dishonouring them by saying, no, it's mm. okay. And, and, and it's, I think even being here in the States, I mean, we, in Britain, we, we suffer from the assumption we get how America works, but we don't. Because we watch movies and we right. watch TV and we think we get it and we watch, and it's always city-based stuff. So we can be left genuinely perplexed, not only by, for example, the rise of Donald Trump, which I think is genuinely, in, for everyone in Britain, pretty much really, really baffling to us, but also just things like healthcare and gun ownership because we because we have our own historical the way that we've dealt with that we can't understand why you don't just think the same way we do i mean mm -hmm. you speak the same language as us like oscar wilde you know i mean right but but that but that's but it's a cultural separation so the more times i come to america the more i try to understand that we're not the same people in 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 so many different ways actually it isn't just political ways it's it it's subtle cultural ways the way in which you don't read people in the same way mm -hmm. um so you try and make that i mean i'm writing a novel i think soon i mean i can't work out whether i can quite solve it but i want to write a novel about walt disney cool but about three different walt disney's about a walt disney who was born if he'd been born in britain one born in Tsarist Russia, and one born in America, but you've been African American. And so you do the, the Walt Disney life story through three different cultural environments. Exp I mean, it, uh, you know, my, my Russian Walt Disney ends up as a propagandist for Stalin, secretly making animated films for himself and for Stalin, who's found out he's doing them and keeps him alive as long as he's entertaining him. You know, and it's, it's fun to do that. And it came out of the fact that I wanted to do a thing about because I find Disney so fascinating. But I realised I couldn't write Disney American mm -hmm. because I can't write American, I'm British. So I thought, well, I'll just make Disney British. And I thought, well, if I can do that, I can also, I can, I can go crazier. And I can say within the text, I'm doing a Russian Disney, even though I can't do Russian. I can, I can stand apart from that a bit. So when I get to my African-American Disney, say, I, it, it becomes clear that these become totems if I try to do a life story novel of Walt Disney, I, all my dialogue would sound appalling because I, I sound British. Everything I write sounds stuffy and repressed because <laughs> that's what I am. So it's, I don't know, um, I think it's, it's, it's honestly about, it doesn't fix it, but you travel around and you become more and more aware of the fact that we're not, all the same and that and there are things to be aware of and if you can do that then maybe you can at least address the problems there, there is absolutely nothing worse than people just ham-fistedly writing other cultures and other genders and other sexualities as if actually it's themselves but it's okay I'm going to say it's this because it just it just seems it's, it's not it's not just that it's, a, it, it's not specifically offensive although it can be it's also just crap and I just don't want to be crap. So that's, I think that's what it does. And I mean, I, I mean, I just love traveling. 
I, I love the idea that I don't travel to get ideas for stories, but right. but they come, mm-hmm. um, and it's often about that cultural imbalance. I, f- I find that fascinating. You know. Already. Yeah, if that makes any sense. So it makes perfect sense. It's a really good answer. Oh, good. And I think that we are out of time. Excellent. Well, <laughs> not that out of time, but I'm glad that that was okay. Yeah. Good. Very good. So thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. That's today's episode. Thanks so much for joining me and a very special thank you to Rob Shearman. Please leave a comment on this episode on Instagram. You'll find me at FY Curiosity. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. See you next time.